Hey, folks. In the song Joker Man by Bob Dylan, every one of the choruses refer to a nightingale, a nightingale's tune. Joker Man danced to the nightingale tune, birds fly high by the light of the moon. And, you know, if you've ever wondered, why would he be referring to a nightingale's tune? Is that just some, he's just talking about some random bird song? Or was there something behind that? Well, if you watch my lyrical review of Joker Man, I'd comment on what I think the song's about. It's a very dynamic lyric in that you can get something new every time you hear it. It's just a marvelous lyric. But I'm pretty sure in my mind, now of course I didn't write the song, but in my mind I'm pretty sure that what it's about is about taking this strong desire, this natural desire that people have for seeking something above and beyond their own existence, their own life, something that's better either an afterlife or, or a, a, a different realm or heaven or whatever. And, and that desire to find something that is... So in other words, if you have a life that's not that great and you, you have a lot of death or uh, pain and you struggle, it's only human nature to wish and hope and have faith in something better, something, something that's going to be so much more fulfilling and, and wonderful than this life here. I mean, it's just, it's human nature. And so there's some people that know that and they, and they go into the ministry, they go into um, types of uh, philosophies and, and they try to help other people in that regard. But then there's people that, that try, that go into that realm try, tr t of helping people, but only do so really to manipulate people, to try to give people false uh, teaching, um, uh, false ideas, I, even things they don't even believe in necessarily themselves. Maybe they want to, but they, you know, whatever. And they do that to manipulate others. And I think that's kind of what the song was about, about people who mislead people, maybe not even necessarily um, intentionally. Maybe they believe every word they say, but whatever. And I think that's what this whole point is about this nightingale. Because if you, if you think about the other times that nightingales have been used in, in great poetry, the nightingale is always referred to as a... a and let me, let me just start off saying something about John Keats, the, his famous Ode to a Nightingale. I'm going to get to the poem I really want to talk about here in a minute. But the John Keats poem, if you've never read the poem because you thought an Ode to the Nightingale, that must be some, you know prissy poem about birds. No, it's much more deep than that. See, John Keats, only, he died when he was 25 years old. He had a very difficult life. His parents died when he was young. Uh, his brother died of tuberculosis, and John Keats was his, his brother's nurse, watched him die. And then John Keats found out he, was, he, he had tuberculosis, which was basically a death sentence back then. And... Um, so he knew he was going to die, and he was only 25 years old, and he's writing these, these odes, these poems. And so this ode to a nightingale is relating, uh, is referring to uh, his mortality, how he's try, how, trying to deal with the knowledge that he's going to die, uh, and, and, and hoping for immortality perhaps. But, but, and, and this nightingale that, that sings to him is, is, a, is a song of hope. It's a song of optimism, but at the same time, he knows he's probably going to... In, in other words, it's a very deep poem. But the nightingale is a, is a, is a bird that, not always, but usually sings at night. And, and what do you have at night? You have darkness, you have cold, you can't see. You know, and, and most of the time at night, when you can't, your other senses are not working well, that's when all of the despair and all that you may have start, starts to really manifest itself in your mind and things get pretty dark, right? And so when the nightingale is singing at night, you're holding on to, you're latching on to that. You're hoping for something. And you see the nightingale as perhaps a voice uh, of hope. And so, and the other poem I'm going to read to you here is very similar to that. It's a poem by Robert Bridges called Nightingales. It's a shorter poem, so I'm going to read that one. <clears throat> but in that case, too, the nightingale is a voice of hope and of, and of you know, optimism, of immortality, 
of, of another di existence after this difficult one here. And, um, and so it could be that when Dylan referred to the Joker Man dancing to the Nightingale's tune, he did so because the Joker Man was kind of being a nightingale, so to speak, to people who were in the dark, who were in, in their, you know, metaphorically, uh, in the dark. They couldn't see around them very well, but they were focused on something other than what was around them, a different life, another world, a heaven, or those kind of things. And here, here is this Joker Man, you know, man of the mountains. You can walk on the clouds, manipulator of crowds. He's a dream twister. At those nighttime dreams, he can twist those dreams, the dreams that uh, Keats refers to in his poem. And so I think that's why he used the nightingale imagery there to say that the Joker Man was acting sort of like that nightingale. But he could also be saying that the Joker Man himself listens to the nightingale and he himself also has hopes for, for something better and bigger and, and most more marvelous than what's on the earth. That's what it could be. All right, so I'm going to read to you Robert Bridges' uh, poem, Nightingales. It's uh, only three stanzas, it's not too long. And then I'll refer back to the John Keats here shortly, okay? All right, Nightingales by Robert Bridges. Robert Bridges lived from the 1840s to the 1930s in that eight range. Uh, John Keats lived in the 17, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. Like I said, he was only 25 years old when he died. Okay, Nightingales. Beautiful must be the mountains whence ye come, and bright in the fruitful valleys the streams wherefrom ye learn your song. So this, this, the narrator is talking to the, the nightingale, saying, oh, it must be so beautiful where you come from, and fruitful, fruitful valleys and streams where you learn this song. When you bring this song to me, you're bringing it from basically paradise. Where are those starry woods? Oh, might I wander there among the flowers, which in that heavenly air bloom the year long. Perpetual spring, perpetual summer, that heavenly air. Oh, nightingale, tell me all about it. Tell me all about this, this next life, this next place I'm going to go, that I want to go. Now, what does the nightingale say back? Nay, barren are those mountains and spent the streams. Our song is the voice of desire that haunts our dreams, a throw of the heart, whose pining visions dim, forbidden hopes profound, no dying cadence nor long sigh can sound for all our art. Now, that's a totally different picture than the picture that the listener is getting, or in his own mind, perhaps, taking from the Nightingale's song. In other words, the listener is imposing on the Nightingale's song, basically, his own hopes and dreams and desires. It's nighttime. He can't see. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. It's going to be clear that this is nighttime. So all he can do is hear, and he's hearing this Nightingale, and he's, used, he's imposing his own dreams and his hopes on the Nightingale. And the Nightingale's saying, no, where I come from, it's not what you think. And the nightingale goes a little further. Alone, aloud, in the raptured ear of men, we pour our dark nocturnal secret. Nighttime. Raptured men, see, there's this tendency for mankind to really strongly desire something other than their own presence in this lifetime. And it becomes a rapture to them to think about rapturing away, about transcending this life, to go to some other, other place. Alone, aloud, and aloud, in the raptured era of men, we pour our dark nocturnal secret. And then, as night is withdrawn from these sweet springing meads and bursting boughs of May, dream while the innumerable choir of day welcome the dawn. So what I get from this, and, what, and you, it's the same thing we get in, in the Keats poem here in a minute, I'll show you. These people are listening to the nightingale at night, can't see that they are in 
springtime themselves. They're wanting a perpetual spring. They want the blooms all year long. But what they can't see until the dawn shows them that they're standing amidst sweet springing meads and bursting boughs of May. They're deep into spring as it is. They can't see the beauty around them. There may be hard times, but they live in a beautiful world. They're so fortunate to live in this world, but they don't think that way. They're thinking of what's going to come next. We pour our dark nocturnal secret, and then as night is withdrawn from these sweet springing meads and bursting bells of May, dream. The nightingales, then they dream. Earlier, it was the people that dreamed that now the nightingales dream while the innumerable choir of day, all these other birds, these other birds that wake up with the dawn and start singing their song, welcome the dawn. But the, the people, they don't notice all of those birds singing at dawn and all the beauty around them that they live in a spring of their own. They're thinking, no, no. There's something more. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be something else, you see. And that's what they hear in the nightingale, or so they think. And that's what they hear in the joker man, that false teacher. So they think. Now, let's look at Keats. I can't read this whole thing because it's a very long poem. Well, it's not very long. Eight stanzas. But there's a few things I want to mention here. Um, he's saying here, he's talking to the nightingale, and he says, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet. Why? Because it's nighttime. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness. Guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast-fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. He's only thinking about those. He can't see them. It's what's so funny to me is that here's a guy. He knows he's going to be dead soon. He's only 25. He hasn't even lived yet. But yet he's still able to comment that there's all around him beauty. That he could, it's all right here. But yet there's that, ten, that tendency, that temptation to follow, follow the nightingale. Listen to the nightingale. Where does he say here? Away, away, for I will fly to thee, he's telling the nightingale. I'll follow you. Not charioted by Bacchus and his pars, not by drinking and getting drunk and all that, but on the viewless wings of poesy, of po poetry. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, away with thee, tender is the night, and happily the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays, her fairies. But here there is no light save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through the verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. The basic idea, again, the nightingale is a message to those who want something from the nightingale, but the nightingale is not singing that message. They only want it to sing that message so they impose upon the nightingale their own dreams and hopes and desires. John Keats didn't want to die. He wanted, uh, he, although he says in this poem sometimes, he says that sometimes he wishes he could just go ahead and get it done. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death. In other words, the ease, the peace of death. Called him soft names in many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die. So he was in a bad way. He was a, 
But he says, thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The, boy, the voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found the path through the sad heart of Ruth, the biblical character, when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. That I think is why Dylan chose the Nightingale, because he's he's saying that he's saying that the Joker man, with all his dream weaving, dream twister, manipulator of crowds, all the things he thought he was able to do, was a type of a song of Nightingale, that Keats wrote about, that Robert Bridges wrote about. That's what I'm thinking. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about this. Have you ever wondered why he sang? or dance to the Nightingale tune in that song, Joker Man? Why, what was, that, was that significant? Have you ever put any idea or any thoughts into that? If you have and you have some ideas, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but I love encountering poetry that I think when I read it that Dylan probably was influenced by it to some extent. I'd love to talk to him and ask him. Uh, but yeah, just let me know what you guys think. Okay, folks, I did this sort of on the fly. I just happen to say, you know, I got some time here. Nobody's around. I figured I'd make a quick video here, and uh, perhaps I, maybe I could have thought a little more deeply about it. But, you know, it's good just to have a little tease there and, and prompt some thought. So think about it and let me know what you think, folks. Robert Bridges, Nightingales. And John Keats, Ode to a Nightingale. Two magnificent poems about a nightingale, almost as good as Bob Dylan's Joker Man. <laughs> See you later, folks. Bye-bye.